Today's presenters are Brian Galanek of All Star Incentive Marketing and Afdel Aziz of Conspiracy of Love. Brian Galanek is a certified professional of incentive management, CPIM, and the president of All Star Incentive Marketing, a 45 year old company that helps its customers focus on improving the safety, health, and wellness of workers by first improving employee, employee engagement. He is a member of the Incentive Marketing Association and other strategic industry groups and a board member of the Incentive Foundation. He also produced countless articles and white papers and presented dozens of seminars and webinars on these and related topics to HR, safety, and operations leaders around the world. Afdel Aziz is a writer, speaker, consultant, and one of the most respected voices in global movement of business as a force for good. He is the co-founder and chief purpose officer of Conspiracy of Love, a global brand purpose consultancy with Fortune 500 clients like Adidas, Oreo, Red Bull, Microsoft, and more. He's also a Forbes contributor and international keynote speaker who has been featured at the Cons Lions, South by Southwest, TEDx, Advertising Week, and Conscious Capitalism. So at this time, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Brian Galanek. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, everybody, for being here today. Another great turnout. Uh, obviously, the subject matter resonates greatly with this audience, and so it gives us great pleasure to deliver this content today, uh, the connection between EE and ESG, right? Employee engagement in the environmental, social, and corporate governance movement that I'm sure if you're like me, you hear more and more about every single day. Pardon me, don't know why that happens. I know why that happens. Despite all the prep, Mike, I still screwed it up, sorry. Okay. So welcome everybody. The agenda, uh, I'm gonna to talk to you about employee engagement. It's certainly the, uh, the, the foundation of what my company does and um, in the role of recognition and empathy and employee engagement. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Afdel who's gonna to talk to you about the power of purpose. Then I'm gonna come back and try to connect some of those dots for you again about employee engagement and ESG and how they all come together under one roof. We'll talk about some keys to success and then handle a Q&A at the end here. So, uh, there's, so you see the poll question on screen, go ahead and pop the poll up, Mike. Um, and you can start answering the question. First, let me tell you, there are hundreds of senior level executives um, signed up for today's webinar. And so you're gonna get a good feel for how the senior level HR ops, safety managers, C-suite employees or, or managers uh, view these questions that we have in a couple of polls throughout the, uh, the course of the webinar. Many of you, some of you have been on my webinars before. And again, that's very encouraging. Appreciate y'all coming back to hear more. And if you have been here before, you'll know this is a question we start off with frequently, which is just, and it's a table setter, right? What's your perception? How do you feel about the employee engagement levels within your organization? And you guys are popping in the answers fast and furious. So I'm going to go ahead and um, end and push those results out so we can all see what they look like. Okay. So again, this is, a, it's a bit of a setup, but I apologize if you've been with me before, you know why I'm doing this, right? On the phone, we have, you know, the more the most dominant answer is 40 to 59 percent, but followed by 60 to 79 percent. If you were to just kind of distill the numbers you see on screen there and say, what is, you know, the people on the line here, the hundreds of senior level HR professionals and how well they think their employees are engaged on the job, you might come up with an average number here of maybe 60, 65 percent, right? 65, the people on the phone think 65 percent or more on average, again, for the, the people answering this poll of their employees are engaged, Okay. And so let me just kill that survey. And so moving on to the next slide, and I think, again, some of you probably know where I'm going with this, the difference between perception and reality, right? Now, there's no doubt in my mind, some of you who think 65 or 70% or 80% of your employees are engaged might actually be right. But based on average numbers, feeding off of the Gallup State of the American Workplace study, which we refer to frequently, um, the reality is probably not as good as you think it is. Right, just based on the fact that only about 35% of Gallup's of the workers that Gallup um, engages with come through as being highly engaged at work. Okay, another 50% plus or minus are considered not engaged, not bad workers, but not fully aligned with the company's mission, purpose, and values. And 15% plus or minus should be fired tomorrow. They're disengaged, actively disengaged employees, and they're harmful to your company. We all know we have them. Not only are they not brand ambassadors, they're brand uh, detractors and a problem for your organization. And you can see the half a trillion dollars or so that's lost every year uh, by employers that employ disengaged employees. And so, you know, what happens is if you're in that top 25% most engaged companies in terms of your employee levels of engagement versus the bottom 
in whatever industry you're in, right? It could be the insurance industry, the car industry, it doesn't make a difference. If you're among the top 25%, you have 50% fewer accidents, far fewer injuries, quality defects, less turnover, far fewer in the way of absenteeism and, and, um, and tardiness and what have you. And of course, if you're on the other side of it, the, the numbers come out the other side, right? If you're in the top 25%, you also have 10% better employee, uh, I'm sorry, customer retention, 21% better productivity and profitability, right? So employee engagement is a massive, massive undertaking and value to you as an employer in terms of driving, not just, not just doing good for doing good sake, but doing good, having engaged employees for the benefit of the company. There's some stats on screen here. That's a lot of words for a slide, but I'm gonna to speak to just a couple of them. 87% of, of um, so employee engagement matters. And how do we get there? Recognition and empathy, we'll, which we'll talk about right now. 80% of recognition programs focus on tenure alone. That's not good news. What that means is that when companies say, oh yeah, we have an employee rewards program, more often than not, what they're talking about is their years of service program. And as I think anyone on the phone would agree, nobody in year 11 working for your company is gonna last stick around till year 15 to get the 15 year service award, okay? That type of years of service tenure program is not one that engenders um, brand loyalty and customer and, and, uh, and loyalty to your company. It's a nice thing to do. You should have them, just about any company of size does, but that's not truly an employee engagement program. It's more of a thank you for the last five years. When asked what leaders could do to improve engagement, 58% of respondents replied, uh, by adding more recognition. Honestly, it should be 100%, but at least 58% of managers realize that recognition delivered consistently. Um, and the 42% that don't realize that probably just haven't, haven't really absorbed the data that leads them to realize that lack of recognition is the number one reason somebody leaves a job, right? So you need recognition in order to, to drive levels of, um, of employee engagement. The real interesting news is millennials uh, need it more than, than most. And I hate to stereotype an entire generation, but when a stereotype fits, it fits. These, this generation, 35 and under, and the generations that come behind it grew up in a fully connected world and they're very used to being engaged all the time. They're, in, they're used to instant feedback and they crave it. And so your 60 year old workers maybe look at this one way, but you're the math majority of your workforce now, uh, at least the majority of the US workforce is now the millennials are under and you better be responsive to how they view things more so than other workers. And they crave feedback. They wanna know they work for a company that has a mission, purpose, and values, which Aftel will speak more to as well. And uh, you better be delivering recognition. So 69% of employees work harder if they felt that their, their efforts were appreciated. The 31% that's missing from that number, to me, is, is very clearly the 15% that are actively disengaged because they don't care, they couldn't care less what you launch. And obviously some of your better self-motivated employees are gonna be hard workers regardless of whether you put a recognition reward program in place. But that middle 60, 50, 60, 70% can be motivated um, as with a program like that in place. Um, only 14% of organizations provide managers with the necessary tools to recognize and reward their employees. Again, it's about making recognition a seamless part of your culture. There are ways to do that. And it's one of the, the first things you should do if you're trying to pursue along the lines of what we're talking about today. 41% um, of companies use peer -to -peer rec that use peer-to-peer -peer recognition have seen positive increases in customer satisfaction. About 100% that use peer-to-peer -peer recognition see a positive uh, impact in morale and in team building and what happens inside. But what makes this one interesting is that on top of that, 41% say it actually had a positive effect on, on customer satisfaction, which is customer retention, which is growth and profitability. JetBlue did a study that a 10% increase uh, in employees reporting being recognized equals a 3% increase in retention and a 2% increase in engagement. I mean, a 3% increase in retention, as I said, a lot of Fortune 500 companies on the phone, a lot of companies with thousands or tens of thousands of employees, a 3% increase in retention in a company with 10,000 employees is massive, all right? And if you had a 20% increase in, in recognizing employees and you've got an even bigger number, you know, it's just, it's not just about the loss of a body, it's the cost of a loss of a body and particularly losing a really good, valuable employee. A lot of the estimates are 25 to 150% of that employee's salary is what it costs you to lose that person. So lose a $60,000 supervisor and it can cost you easily 20,000 to, to more than $60,000 to replace that person. Some of those are hard cost. A lot of them are lost opportunities and what have you. And so long-term programs are far more powerful than short-term programs, more than double. And 85% of employees see a link again between their motivation level and the quality and quantity of their work.
right? So that was recognition as a component of employee engagement. This is empathy as a, as a component of employee engagement. And this is not a college class, so I'm not gonna sit here and really do a deep dive on the difference between these, but cognitive empathy is just too little. It's like, okay, I recognize your pain, but I have no shared feelings for it. Emotional empathy is, is really, is too much, right? That's, uh, that's um, I'm, I'm distraught because you're distraught. And that's not really what an HR manager or managers in general can do, but that compassionate empathy is generally considered the place where this concern, okay, I feel for you as a human being, I'm walking a mile in your shoes and I have a logical emotional response to it. And that's just the right amount of delivering of empathy. And having just come through COVID, I think we're all seeing this, right? I mean, we've had to be extremely empathetic and, and adaptable to the fact that some of our employees were almost literally unaffected by it emotionally, right? It is what it is, we'll get through it. And others were really re reduced in a way that made them uh, barely able to function. And so being empathetic and, and, and having systems and processes and the right people in place to deal with that is enormously important. So using recognition, using empathy as part of, the, part of your mantra, and then knowing the difference between intrinsically and extrinsically motivated people. Again, in that 35%, maybe not all of it, but in that 35% that are actively engaged on the job, you have a you know, nice uh, quantity of people that are intrinsically motivated. They get up in the morning, their feet at the floor, they're ready to go. They know what the company is all about. They understand your mission values and values and they, and they wear them, okay? They're a great brand ambassador, okay? But then you got that big middle 60% that not bad workers, not bad people, but you can motivate them to carry the message forward, to work harder, to work smarter, to work safer, to participate in the wellness program, to be a better coworker and a better team builder. You can do that through the use of recognition and rewards. And when you do that, as the slide says, when two and three come together, you get more of, more of, of what you're looking for, more of number one, which is you build muscle memory, right? The person who gets recognition for being a star performer or a champion of the company wellness program, who participates in the walking competition and, and attends the, uh, the, the seminars on, on eating healthy and financial health and stress and quit smoking. Those people who build muscle memory around that become healthier on the job, become ambassadors of your company and your company's wellness program are enormously valuable in all kinds of ways and far less likely to leave your company, all right? So then just playing a little fast and loose with a Jeff Bezos quote, right? So Amazon largest company in the world, Bezos richest man in the, in the, in the world, uh, he famously said, your margin is my opportunity. And I like to, I think about that when I think about, there are some C-suite um, professionals on the line here with us today, but there's also a whole lot that report to the C-suite. And what do you, what do you say to the C-suite when you're asking for resources, okay, to truly be a better company at delivering at ESG? At, you know, the company has a statement about its carbon footprint, but do they really walk the walk in trying to improve that? You know, a company has policies around promoting from within and employee development, but do they really walk the walk? And when you're asking for the resources to do these things, to truly drive recognition, employee engagement, have a more engaged workforce, I really, to me, my play on this, on this uh, quote is, you know, your employee engagement is my opportunity, i.e. your lack of employee engagement, or to the point where your, employee le your levels of employee engagement aren't where they could be, you're missing an opportunity. And as your competitor, that's my opportunity to pick off your business, to pick off your employees, and to do better than you do, right? So margins one and Amazon isn't just a, doesn't just compete on price. They have a whole bunch of policies that make them successful, but certainly you can look at it and say, margin is one way of looking at it. Employee engagement is another as it's gonna to relate to the success of our company. This is just one example of really a larger topic, which is that if you've been paying attention and if you maybe you invest a little bit, you have now seen that there are entire ETFs um, built around employee engagement and there are entire ETFs built around ESG. So it's no longer, it's not no longer, forever and a day, there'll be ETFs built around technology companies and healthcare and what have you. But it's not just that the financial world is looking at this and saying, boy, employee engagement matters. They've actually gone out and used EE and ESG to build ETFs that have companies from all kinds of disparate vertical industries, because it doesn't make a difference what industry you're in. If your ESG and your EE are good, or better than good or better than average in that top 25%, it's gonna come through as profitability at the end. And this example is the C. Everett Coop uh, story where C. Everett Coop, former Surgeon General, really took, gave a, a score basically on the health and wellness that companies were delivering to their employees. And the companies he scored at the highest levels of really caring about their employees' health and wellness outperformed the stock market by you know 
relative to just your average company, right? So this is how when you're going to the C-suite and you can start answering this next poll question, go ahead, Mike, and pop it up. When you go into the C-suite and you're talking to them about what matters, you know, part of it you have to talk about, let's face it, are dollars and cents. And this is not, again, just doing good for good sake. It's doing good because it also greatly benefits the company as a whole. So the question that's on screen, and I see a lot of you already answering it, please keep doing so, is, and this is esoteric, I'll, I'll grant you that, right? It's no way you can just pull a number off the top of your head and know exactly how good you are at ESG. But environmental, social, corporate governance, all the stuff you're hearing about on the news all day long, from carbon footprint to diversity uh, policies, what have you, promoting from within, developing employees' future, that whole people, planet, prosperity thing. Um, how good do you think your company is at it? Okay, and I got a ton of answers in already, which is great. So I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll and share the results. And so here's what we have to work with. And I'm gonna hand this over to Afdel here in just a second. And Afdel, what you got basically is, I think you'd pretty much look at these numbers and say everybody on average, the companies on the phone think they're doing a pretty average job as it relates to uh, ESG. And so that's something you can actually uh, feed off of in your discussion. And with that, again, I'll turn it over to Afdel Aziz. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, pleasure to be with you and coming to you from Los Angeles. Um, I'm uh, uh, somebody who is a geek about this topic. So anytime I get a chance to come and talk about purpose, I love it. Uh, my background is I spent 20 years working for companies like Procter & Gamble and Nokia in London, Heineken and Absolute Vodka in New York. Um, and along the way, I developed this passion for the idea that business could be both a force for growth and a force for good. Uh, I do this uh, through my consultancy, Conspiracy of Love. Uh, we work with companies like Adidas and Red Bull and Oreo and lots of other brands you might have heard of to help them find ways to do well by doing good. Uh, I also write about this topic for Forbes, which gives me a ringside seat into this purpose revolution that's happening. Um, and I also uh, have written a book called Good is the New Cool, The Principles of Purpose, which I'm going to give you guys a sneak peek. The book's only coming out in April, but Brian uh, asked me to come and share some of the nuggets of information. Um, the book is really a handbook for CEOs who want to transform their companies into being purpose-driven ones. We've spent the last four and a half years studying some of the most incredible companies on the planet, like Tesla and Patagonia and Lego and Chobani and distilling it down into a set of principles uh, to guide uh, C-suite leaders and uh, leaders of all uh, sizes and shapes as they start to transform their companies into forces for good. So let's start by talking a little bit about why this uh, kind of consciousness shift is happening uh, towards this idea uh, of business as a force for good. And it's because uh, we, we talk about these three tectonic shifts hitting companies all at the same time. One is the rise of socially conscious consumers. Um, consumers who are now saying loud and clear that they want the brands in their lives, not only to stand for something good, but also to do something good to help people and the planet. Two is the rise of what we call activist employees, um, highly engaged employees, as Brian was talking about, who have new expectations of the companies that they work for, of the values they want that company to, to behave with, uh, and how their leadership shows up in the world, uh, especially in these turbulent times. And thirdly, it's the rise of impact investors. Uh, those investors who are looking at ESG and a range of other metrics as they decide what to invest in, whether these are large institutional investors or whether they're private uh, shareholders, um, there really is a new normal in terms of wanting to see social impact alongside financial returns. So when you put these three things together uh, and you put a company at the center of it, you begin to see that this is a tectonic shift in the way business as normal has done. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about each of these three uh, as we go through it. Let's talk about consumers first. So I've been a professional marketer for 25 years and I've never seen numbers like this by pretty much every single metric by which you can judge the success of a brand, uh, purpose-driven brands succeed more. So number one, with trial. 66% of consumers are willing to switch from a known brand to an unknown purpose-driven one that they think is doing some good in an authentic, meaningful manner. Uh, when it comes to advocacy, 78% of consumers would tell others to buy from a purpose-driven company. I think we all know the value of word of mouth. And today with social media, you can have that word of mouth at scale. So it's hugely valuable to companies. And from a price premium perspective, 70% of purpose-driven shoppers 
pay an added premium of 35% more uh, for sustainable purchases such as recycled or eco-friendly goods. So uh, across the board, you see the value of this uh, in catering to these conscious consumers um, and kind of finding ways to deliver products which are both ethical and sustainable. This is also now correlated with growth. This is the Kantar Purpose 2020 study. I highly recommend you checking it out. They did this fascinating research which looked at the companies which they recognize as having a high commitment to purpose, growing at more than twice the rate of others. Um, so there is now the data which is starting to show um, the, the connection uh, between doing good and doing well when it comes to consumers. A lot of it is driven by the arrival of new consumer generations, including millennials, uh, who now have a global annual spending power of $2.5 trillion. And 95% of them say they would switch brands to one that supported a good cause in an authentic, meaningful manner. So you begin to see the, the enormous opportunity that this presents. Um, it's summed up for them in this great quote from the writer Anne Lappy, every time you spend money, you're casting a vote for the kind of world you want it. And especially now, especially over the last 18 months, as we've seen the breakdown of civil society, uh, they're turning to brands to stand up for what they believe in and help solve some of the biggest problems in the world. Secondly, let's talk about employees, as we talked about those engaged employees that everybody wants uh, in their workforces as well. Um, when you look at millennials and Gen Z, we like to say that purpose and a paycheck is the new normal. Um, they just have higher expectations of the companies that they want to work for. Uh, nearly 64% of millennials won't take a job if a potential employer doesn't have a strong CSR practice. 85% of Gen Z employees believe companies have an obligation, an obligation to help solve social problems. Um, and the HR folks on the call may attest to this. This is now the number one question they get asked in interviews uh, by candidates. What is your company doing um, that is good for people and the planet as well? But what's really fascinating is that this is now going even further. Uh, we, we identified this phenomenon called the rise of employee activism. So what you're now seeing is employees um, holding their leadership and their companies uh, even more accountable uh, for, for solving the problems in the world. So these are pictures from the Google walkout, 20,000 Google employees walked out in one day to protest against uh, what they felt was unfair payments made to alleged sexual harassers. Uh, Amazon has ongoing issues uh, with, with racism. In fact, yesterday there was a CBS morning, morning um, news article uh, about a worker who has now fired racial discrimination, uh, filed racial discrimination lawsuits. Um, Wayfair, you saw this with um, the whole situation at the border. Um, and you see this in Twitter, you see this in Adidas, you see this in, in so many companies uh, which have uh, this, this, this phenomenon happening. And it's because of this, this is from, uh, this data is from the uh, Edelman Trust Barometer, the 2021 uh, edition, which just came out. Uh, consumers and employees are expected to have a seat at the table. 68% of consumers believe they have the power to force corporations to change. 62% of employees. And look at this number, 50% of those who are employed said, I'm more likely now than a year ago to voice my objections to management or engage in workplace protest. It used to be that you only had um, unions striking uh, you know, against companies, but now what's really fascinating to see is average employees banding together and say, no, if we're part of this uh, company, then we believe we have a right to decide what this company does as well. And then finally, when it comes to investing, this is maybe the most fascinating shift that we've seen. So driven largely by institutional investors like Larry Fink from BlackRock. This is the largest institutional investor on the planet. BlackRock has $7.2 trillion assets under management and has now come out and started vociferously talking about the link between profits and purpose. This is a quote from one of his annual letters. Profits are in no way inconsistent with purpose. In fact, profits and purpose are inextricably linked. BlackRock has now started asking the companies who are in their portfolio to show um, how they're gonna deal with climate risk. Do they have a sustainability plan? They were actively divesting uh, from companies and sectors that they believe don't do good for people and the planet. Um, this is also linked into uh, everyday investors as well who start to look at their portfolios and want, want to have um, you know, a different approach. I myself have a completely fossil fuel free 
401k as a solo entrepreneur. I wanted to have something that doesn't have any investments in oil and gas. I think they're going to be uh, a stranded asset risk. And so I took great pains to make sure that my stock portfolio for retirement didn't have any of those things as well. Um, this is being noticed by um, CEOs, including the Business Roundtable, uh, who somewhat uh, fascinatingly said a couple of years ago, we are moving away from shareholder value being our main objective. We want to think about uh, stakeholder value as being something that we all think about more, uh, which is a complete paradigm shift. Uh, and it's because they, they see this new wave of ESG focused investors wanting to know how they're taking care of all their stakeholders, uh, their employees, their community, uh, and the planet as well, not just this ruthless short term focused on, on delivering shareholder value as well. Again, the data uh, is fascinating. This is more from the Edelman Trust Barometer. 86% of people expect CEOs to publicly speak out about societal challenges like the pandemic, job automation, societal issues, local community issues. Even more than speaking out, they are expecting business to fill the void left by government. 68% of people who were surveyed said, I want CEOs to step in when the government does not fix societal problems. 66% CEOs should take the lead on change rather than waiting for government to impose change on them. You saw this, for example, with the number of companies who stayed in the Paris Climate Accord, even when the United States pulled out. And this number is fascinating. 65% think that CEOs should hold themselves accountable to the public and not just the board of directors or stockholders. Basically, what they're saying is um, you should be responsible to your community, not your capital, uh, if you want to be a leader for the day, for today. All of these three tectonic shifts with consumers, employees, investors, all of this ladder up to something that we believe is going to be as revolutionary and transformative as the arrival of digital. If you remember how companies transformed themselves in the last 10 years to become digital companies, we believe that purpose is the new digital, as this quote from Max Lenderman says. Uh, it is a huge competitive advantage for those who are able to harness it early and quickly and develop those muscles. Um, and it's also a huge competitive risk as you look at the um, competitors around you who are doing the same as well. Um, one question I get asked a lot is, well, what is purpose and how does it link into all the different strands out there uh, around doing good? And this, hopefully this, this simple diagram shows uh, the metaphor of, of a rope. So previously inside companies doing good was kind of siloed into lots of different places. Uh, you have a corporate social responsibility department. Most Fortune 500 companies now have a sustainability department. Uh, cause marketing was purpose as it manifested to consumers. Diversity and inclusion and talent recruitment is how it manifested towards employees, uh, both future and present. Um, ethical supply chains. Uh, people now have an expectation that the products they buy are made by workers in fair conditions. Um, even product innovation now has to take into account how these products are, are designed to be sustainable and ethical. And of course, ESG, as we're talking about it, all of these different strands are weaving together uh, into this broader rope um, that we call purpose uh, as, a, as an umbrella term as well. And just to make sure everybody's on the same page in terms of definitions, um, this is the framework that we use at Conspiracy of Love to explain what it means. So purpose uh, should be at the core of why you exist. Um, that is evergreen, that never changes. So Nike's purpose is to inspire and innovate for every athlete on the planet. That hasn't changed for the last 30 years. The vision is where you want to get to by a specific point in time in line with the purpose. So that could be, for example, for Nike, we want to be the world's leading athletic company, uh, sportswear company by 2025. That can be a bit more granular and a bit more kind of technical. The missions are then uh, what we call the big bold moves that you need to take in order to achieve the vision. That could be your sustainability mission, your people mission, your social purpose mission. It's the things you need to get right in order to achieve the vision. The values are how you behave as an organization, the behaviors and tonalities that make the culture uh, come alive. And then the positioning is how all of the above is encapsulated to occupy a distinct place in people's minds. So in the case of Nike, that is Nike, just do it. And that visual identity, which instantly tells you, yeah, this is a, this is a company and this is what it stands for and, and what it wants to do to inspire people like me as well. So hopefully that definition helped 
clear up some of the questions you might have. Um, I told you guys I was gonna give you a sneak peek from our next book, The Principles of Purpose. We've been researching this for the past four and a half years and studying companies um, like Mattel, like Activision, um, Shabani, Tesla, Patagonia, to really dive into case studies of how they're doing purpose really well in everything from their supply chains to their HR to their even their financial models as well. Um, and what we've done is distill it down into this set of nine principles for any CEO um, to, to really follow when thinking about how she or he can transform their company into a purpose-driven one. So number one, purpose needs to be built inside out. I'll talk a little bit about, more about this. You can't go preaching to the world until you get your own house in order. Um, two is a purpose is about picking your sword and shields. This is the metaphor really about figuring out what is the social problem you're trying to fix in the world. Uh, for Tesla and Patagonia, the problem is climate change. Uh, for other companies like Microsoft, it might be disability. So really figuring out what is the, the problem you're going to try and tackle um, is, is really helpful. The next step are kind of paradoxical. In the long term, purpose must be profitable to be sustainable. This is business. It's not philanthropy. So it needs to have an ROI. But truly purpose-driven companies are prepared to lose money in the short term if it means standing by their values. You look at CVS giving up $2 billion in not selling uh, tobacco products is a great example of this. Um, at the same time, purpose doesn't have to be political. Um, there are a myriad of different causes and issues out there that companies can get involved in, uh, whether it's around economic opportunity or whether it's around uh, mental health and things like that. It doesn't have to always be political and politicized. Uh, the next one is a really useful thing to keep in mind. Purpose is about being the helper, not the hero. Make sure you don't position your company as the savior uh, riding in on a white horse to try and fix the problem. It's really about making your community, your consumers, the heroes and the company is really there to help uh, along the way. Seven is purpose must be an open source pursuit. Really try and think about how you can share intellectual property uh, if there is a way of doing this uh, the, to drive society forward. Volvo shares their seatbelt data with the entire car industry. Uh, companies like Nike and Patagonia open up their supply chain uh, material science if they find a breakthrough that helps makes products more sustainable. Truly purpose-driven companies give away their IP if they feel there is a greater good. Um, eight is purpose must measure what matters. This is really about building a bespoke model for each company so you can measure financial impact, brand affinity, consumer engagement, ESG uh, scores, all of those things to build a multi-dimensional picture. And finally, purpose is a journey, not a destination. Just a reminder that um, just like digital, there is um, uh, there's, there's no perfect place to start. It, it's just about diving in. And then also like digital, there's no end point. There's always an opportunity to evolve the good you can do in the world as well. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I do wanna talk about probably the most important one, which is purpose needs to be built inside out. Um, as, as, as Brian was mentioning, uh, to have engaged employees um, is, is really the key that leads to everything else as well. Um, and so you need to make sure that before you go and start uh, trumpeting to the world about how you're going to change it, you look after people internally. They need to be paid well. They need to have benefits. They need to have a safe, inclusive, non-toxic working environment. And this is really where the whole diversity and inclusion topic, which has blown up in the last year, especially in the wake of, of Black Lives Matter, I think, is really a, the, the, new, the new normal, the new expectation, just like sustainability um, that companies need to have on board. But there's also huge business benefits. This is the Harvard Business Review. Companies with above average diversity have 19% higher innovation revenues. Um, it, it intuitively makes sense. If you have people who reflect the world around you, you will be able to see business opportunities that your competition uh, who may be less diverse don't. This is my favorite image to sum this up. This is the Nike Pro Hijab uh, for Muslim women, uh, which was only introduced in 2017. So my question is, why did it take a company like Nike all this time to figure out that there are maybe half a billion Muslim women on this planet and some of them like to exercise? I would wager it's because they didn't have that representation inside their companies who allowed them to see this massive business opportunity that they're now catering to as well. That's why we kind of say 
diversity is the only global growth strategy. If you want to be a global company, and if you want to reach as many consumers as possible, then you need to reflect that in the makeup of your company. So you're able to authentically uh, speak to their needs and see opportunities before everybody else does as well. Um, a few closing thoughts to wrap up before I hand over to Brian again as well. You know, we're really in this moment where we like to say we're moving beyond corporate social responsibility into corporate social opportunity. Um, for those companies who are focused on making money from solving problems in the world, as opposed to making money by causing problems in the world, problems are gold mines. Um, the United Nations estimates that if all the United Nations SDG goals were accomplished, that's an estimated $16 trillion in unlocked value sitting there. Um, that is the size of the prize that, that really uh, companies should be focused on uh, and repurposing themselves to try and solve this as well. Um, we are in a moment now really where in the wake of the, the pandemic, um, you know, we had phase one, which was really around the responding the immediate needs um, and serving those critical needs to Afghanic society. I believe we're now in phase two uh, with the rollout of the vaccine. People are now looking for fulfillment and connection. But what really occupies my thought is phase three, which is the rebuild phrase. Um, and it's this idea of building back better, which is now taking root. Things may have been broken before the pandemic. So why should we rebuild them back to the way they were? Maybe now is the moment that we can start to think differently about the role of capitalism, about the role of business, about the role of our, of our employees and our companies, and find new ways to construct um, our businesses in a way that serves the needs of people and the planet. I think there is a golden opportunity uh, we've just had in terms of society realizing what it takes um, to work together and proving that we can if we set aside our differences. Um, and so I'll leave you with this final thought, you know, in this new era, um, your values really drive your value. As you start to think about, um, oops, as you start to think about the, um, the, the future ahead, um, really think about how your values as, as a company um, can drive the value that um, you have. This is both yourselves as individuals, um, the idea that you too also want to have meaning and fulfillment in your work. Um, purpose is the path through it. Um, that's what we see. That's what we believe in. That's what we try and galvanize through our work at Conspiracy of Love. So thank you very much for having me here today. I'm uh, so excited to get your questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, and I'm going to hand back over to Brian now um, to keep going. Thank you, Aftel. That was perfect. It was a perfect um, segue from the employee engagement side to, again, operating on, you know, corporations operating under, the, under purpose. Quick story. I'm in my kitchen this morning here at, at my company. Uh, we're, we're partly in, partly out. So I have, you know, part staff based on the COVID response, but we do have some people in the building. And I went in to get a cup of coffee this morning and one of my developers was in there and he was making a pot of coffee. We have the Keurig coffee machine right next to the pot of coffee. And there's only a pot of coffee if somebody takes the time to make it. And we got talking about carrying K cups, and he was saying to me how, how you know the K cups are so bad for the environment. Maybe something All Star obviously should think about doing going forward because we know that they're all plastic, and there's a billion of them a year, or billions that are being thrown away. And he was saying how he bought his his. This was this morning, right? And again, I'm just surrounded by these. Everything I hear seems to be an ESG related, purpose related message. And he was saying how he bought his wife an espresso machine, and on espresso uses their their, their K cups or their their version of the pods are made out of uh, aluminum. And on top of the fact that they're made out of aluminum, which is better than throwing plastic away, they also have um, a, a return program. So they give you a postage paid envelope where you can take your spent pods, throw them in the envelope, and a, on their dime, send them back to them and they recycle them. They use the coffee grinds as, as fertilizer and they, they obviously send the, uh, the aluminum off to be recycled and they have an entire video. I went to their website just to see this for myself. They have an entire video built around what they do. And it suggests that, you know, the, the aluminum melted down is used to make bikes and, and again, reduce its carbon footprint. For him, it was a very meaningful story for him and his wife. There's no chance they would switch over to a carrying machine and start using plastic cups. And it made an impact on me as well, because I've thought to myself, I don't really like that, that carrying machine. And yet the company kind of, you know, employees sort of rely on it. And maybe it leads me to make a switch. Just a simple, small example from a simple discussion I had today, just a passing conversation about how Nespresso's message about being more than just a company that wants you to buy their coffee 
uh, might actually have an impact on their sales and their future growth. And I just thought I'd share it with you. So uh, thank you again, Afdel. It's great, great uh, coverage there again about purpose. So Afdel's entire conversation is about the broader topic, right? And, and about the win-win that, that's in there for companies that, that, um, that work around a purpose and then inspire their, their workforce and deal with the, the, all their stakeholders, right? Not just the shareholders. It's not just about producing a really good quarter next quarter financially. It's always gonna be about that in part but it's also about dealing with all of their stakeholders, their employees, their customers, the communities in which they live, and, and how, do they, you know, how do they handle that aspect of the responsibility of being a corporation. You know, I was actually reflecting back today that the original ESG uh, you know, solution that, that many companies provided for their employees, employees is healthcare, right, is health insurance. And I, I was curious myself this morning, just getting ready for this webinar, so I looked it up, it was post-World War II, and it's a long story, but the government put a policy in place, and that policy didn't do what it was intended, but it ended up resulting in the fact that companies were inspired to provide health insurance for their, their employees. And whether or not that's the right system or not, either way, it was the first sort of thing that companies were doing uh, that I can certainly find that was meant to really help their employees outside of just you know making them better employees. And so as we look today at the evolution from post-World War II to now, and then you see the codification through the World Economic Forum um, of these four pillars of, of ESG, so much of which is reflected in what Aftel was talking about, planet, people, prosperity, and corporate governance, right? And to the right on this slide, you have some of the 22 metrics, not all of them, but I just put a few up on the slide because, and I won't speak to all of them, but just how easy it is to see the connection between levels of employee engagement, companies' ESG efforts, and how they come together, right? So when it comes to safety and health, having recognition programs in place, you already have safety programs in place, you already have wellness programs in place, probably, most companies do, but your wellness program, as an example, is probably a poster hanging on a wall, okay, with the four basic food groups, or maybe it's more than that, but it tends to be underutilized. Most company wellness programs have 15, 20% participation levels, and that's, that's not good, right? You can easily double or triple that or more by putting a recognition program on top of your wellness program or putting your, your company's total recognition rewards program and including your wellness program in there. Okay, when you have walking competitions, building teams to compete with each other, you end up with a great, lot of great water cooler conversations or Zoom based you know, conversations these days around how many steps they got the day before or how much weight they've lost or the fact that they quit smoking or people taking in the, uh, you know, the financial health side of things. So again, using em engaged employees, creating engaged employees, using recognition, empathy, uh, to help get further and further, more and more engaged employees. And then using that in part to transition over to the four pillars and the metrics that, again, this World Economic Forum came out and said was so important. They didn't, this isn't a mandate, okay? But there's a reason why it's not a mandate for companies to do this. It's an opportunity as, as Aftel was highlighting. And so for companies to center on these metrics and to work off of these four pillars in the way in which, again, they deal with all their stakeholders, can be enormously valuable to them. Again, if you're hearing about that today. And, and so the proof is really in the way in which they, they brand and market the solutions that they have both internal and external to the company. And you know, after I was sort of referring to this a minute ago, just think of the job titles that exist today that didn't before, chief, chief people officer and what have you, diversity and inclusion officers. You know, the, the corporate world is reacting probably more effectively and faster than government is reacting to this issue and using it when done right to their great advantage. So I had that quote up earlier playing off of Jeff Bezos, right? Your, your margin is my opportunity. As I said, your EE is my opportunity. Your ESG is my opportunity. It's your opportunity, right? To go out there, your level of, of, of environmental, social, corporate governance, people, planet, prosperity, your level of caring about that for your employees and using engagement tactics to get them to get them fully aligned with your corporate values and mission statement. This is your opportunity and it's also your risk. If you're not doing it, you're exposing yourself to being picked off by companies that are doing it better, right? And so I've said at every webinar I've ever delivered and it's true and it, it's, it still remains true. I'm not saying it got displaced. It's still true that employees tend to leave, uh, leave their relationship with the manager more than they quit a job, right? They're not quitting a company as often, at least historically as they are leaving the fact that they don't have a good relationship with their manager. Their manager tells them when they do it, do it wrong and they don't tell them anything in between. They don't know how to deliver recognition and help really steer people, coach them uh, towards being better employees and, and obviously growing within a company. And so if you have a poor relationship with your manager, 
you're likely to leave. If a company gives that manager easy to use tools, click, click, swipe, deliver recognition, it's empowering that manager to be a better manager and to deliver that recognition and keep that employee engaged. But so while all that's true, what's also true today, and again, particularly with millennials and the generations that are coming behind them, it's also not just about your relationship with your manager, it's about your, your, your investment, mental investment with your company in your company's values. Do, do the employees at Nespresso um, feel more empowered by the fact that Nespresso is doing something to, to take care of the environment? I'm sure they do. Not every one of them, okay? I'm not Pollyannish about this, but not every one of them. But if a big enough chunk of them, if that middle 60% feel at least somewhat empowered by the fact that the company they work for cares about the environment and not just the next financial report, they're likely to last longer, work harder, work smarter, work safer, be brand ambassadors or what have you. Okay, so employee engagement, the ESG movement and keys to success and sort of tying these threads together a little bit, right? It starts in the C-suite, right? Plenty of things that happen in, in companies bubble up from, from all levels of the company. And certainly as I think AFTEL was highlighting, I think with Google again about the, the stage walkout and protest of, of a policy they don't like, that's clearly still there. And it's a risk that if you're not doing it right, you might have some of that um, dissatisfaction with your employees. But at the end of the day, a company's stated mission values and purpose are gonna come from the C-suite. It's gonna come from the top. What do we care about as a company? over and above making profits, okay? And so if you're on the phone and you report to the manager that reports to the C-suite or you report directly to the C-suite, it's getting them um, emotionally involved in the fact that it's not just doing good for good sake, it also has a dual win-win purpose. Use your existing programs. Again, I know there's questions about how do you even get started? You're not starting from square one. Any company on the phone here, big or small, has safety programs and PPE training. They have wellness programs, even if it's not being uh, really promoted. They have training programs, they have sales and onboarding programs or what have you. And so wherever you have those interaction points with your existing employees, you have the opportunity to start to work with what we're talking about here today. Those become engagement opportunities in and of themselves. You just have to think of them as more than what they are. It's not just a training program, it's training retention. Okay, we're gonna re recognize, tell people at the beginning of the training that they can earn recognition and points, let's say for, for retaining what they learned here today, for passing a test at the end, you give them a quiz 30 days later and they get all the questions right and they get rewarded for doing so. Okay, you're, you're, you're getting a dual win there, which is they understand the safety training better to begin with, they're more able to apply it in the job they're doing and they feel recognized for, being, for doing it right, right? Win-win. Um, recognition and the reward program structure. It's so easy to get it wrong. Um, one minor example is that there is real nuance to when you want to recognize and reward a group versus recognize and reward the individual. And so there's just, there's a lot there to, to know, a lot there to unpack. You have to make sure you're using the right help to, to build it the right way. Tangible rewards um, and experiential rewards. If you think you're doing a good job with your employee recognition program and you're using cash as the reward or, or cash substitutes like gas cards and gift cards, you're, you're burning your money. You're lighting it on fire. It's a waste of money. Compensation, as Afdel said, needs to be in line with where it needs to be to certainly check that box. But when, you comes, when it comes to recognizing or rewarding people for going above and beyond, um, it's about experiential, it's about tangible rewards and cash and gift cards are truly forgotten within moments of getting them or people don't even remember getting them. So you really need to have, again, this is about program structure, the types of rewards, how you brand your program and communicate it. You don't just wanna call it you know, your, your recognition program, you want to put a brand name on it and promote it like the valuable brand that it is. It's again, something for your employees to rally around and it allows you to carry that purpose even more forward into your message, right? It's all positive reinforcement. You have plenty of ways of punishing your employees when they do it wrong. Everything we're talking about here today is about recognizing them and rewarding them when they do it right. That's the way you get sustainable long-term behavior change. Um, expand the reach. And I'll talk about this on the next slide. Uh, make it easy. Again, Make it very easy for your managers to deliver recognition. If it's cumbersome, they won't do it. But if you get the right platform in place, it becomes very easy for them within a structure of a program to recognize and or reward somebody for doing it, doing it uh, well. Uh, benchmark and measure. 22% of companies, generally speaking, measure the results of these types of programs. That's awful. It's a missed opportunity, right? So when you measure the results of your program, you're far more likely to be able to tweak and change and keep it dynamic and make that program relevant uh, month in, month out, year in, year out. 
And so you need to measure the results. If we're talking about reduced turnover, if we're talking about fewer accidents and injuries, if we're talking about greater participation in your wellness program, if we're talking about more charitable uh, contributions and within my own company, I give people paid time where they can go do charitable work of their choice, right? I'm paying them and they're gonna donate a morning and they're gonna go, this is a real example, they go to local farms and pick produce. The farms are willing to donate the produce to the, the food banks. They call for volunteers to come pick it. So some of my employees and, and not that long ago have gone out and, and picked produce and delivered it to food banks. And I, they were on my payroll while I was doing it. That's such a great feel good story for my company that even though I lost a few hours of their work time, I know I gained far more in exchange, right? And then patience, which is to say that, you know, you don't flip a switch and go from an employee engagement scores that are here to here. If you're, getting, if you're nudging them in the right direction, if you're aligning your actions more with your core stated values piece by piece over a period of years and then even decades, you're on the right path. And I mentioned one of these things I'd come back to, which was that total engagement side of things, expanding the program. Most programs that focus on employee engagement and support of corporate, corporate values start off in one place. Maybe it's safety, maybe it's sales, maybe it's wellness, okay, or safety and wellness together. And then over a period of time, it becomes very easy to add spokes to your wheel, okay, and get your years of service and spot recognition, sales incentive programs. You can get these things all lumped together. It's all under your corporate umbrella of total employee engagement, again, with a driven purpose behind it. And you get there by basically getting these spokes to come together on the wheel over a period of time. Okay, so that was a lot we just threw at you. Uh, we only have a few minutes left here, but I'd love to, I'd love to just take some questions and, and have Aftel help me answer them. And I guess I'll start with the first one, really, Aftel, which is, um, you know, where do you start as it relates to, you know, ESG or again, having a company with purpose, if you feel like your company isn't getting it done or doing it as well as they could, where do you think, um, you know, people on the phone that are listening to this message should start? Yeah, it's a great question, Brian. Like everybody's doing something right, right? So for some people, it might be the CSR department. For some people, it might be employee incentives. Uh, it might be what's happening over on the brand side. So there's already a lot of good happening inside the company, right? I think that's where our starting point we always recommend is figuring out how to articulate what the purpose of the company is, right? Um, having that strategic clarity, um, the story internally, so that every single employee, when they walk into work, they know what this company stands for and the good that it's doing in the world uh, is job number one. Um, one of our favorite examples is Microsoft. When Satya Nadella took over as CEO, the very first thing he did was to six, spend six months with his leadership team articulating the purpose of Microsoft, which is to help every person and organization on this planet achieve more. And that's when it started cascading down into all the different um, functions within Microsoft, whether it's consumer facing or gaming or cloud computing, as different uh, groups started to then own that purpose and understand it. But I'd say job number one is always having that, that clarity of purpose so that if you stop an employee and ask them in a corridor, like, what is the purpose of this company? They all should be able to tell you. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a great, great example. And so again, I, I tied, you know, one of the safety, safety is one of those, uh, you know, those metrics under, under ESG and certainly on the people side of things. And I talk about it all the time, we build these programs for, for our customers, again, built around safety and wellness and other, other initiatives. And uh, if the safety program we build for you, again, a company safety program is their program. Ours is the recognition reward component of their program. If, if we build it right and it's promoted right and you stopped anybody in that company, whether they were safety sensitive or not, and you said, what's the name of our safety program? They should be able to fire right back at you. It's committed to safety, uh, road to zero, what have you. It's a brand. And in the programs we build, we put that brand in lights. It's communicated through all the old school ways of posters, flyers, vouchers, certificates, and what have you, obviously through websites and through social media and what have you. And it become, the brand becomes... Uh, something that people will rally around. Again, it's one thing for a CEO of a big company to say, here's what we want, here's the walk we want to walk. It then has to be deployed. And deploying it is about branding and communicating it. And again, getting people to align behind it. And that's again, part of where the whole recognition reward uh, component comes in. Um, another question was, what advice would you give uh, a, a company um, that does not take ESG seriously? Uh, again, I feel it's sort of related to the first question, but you know, how do they, and maybe they're gonna leave their company because they don't see the, 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 uh, the, the real message there, but beyond that, what, what can they do 
to inspire change? I guess it sort of depends on what level of the company they're working from. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that's where you have to kind of start uh, at the place the company is already the most advanced, right? And I think that's where ESG is a relatively new uh, framework, right, for companies to grapple with as well. I think um, starting with the, the place, the path of least resistance, I think, is a good way for purpose to manifest itself in a company. So sometimes we go and speak to uh, com- you know, marketing departments um, and they're focused on brand purpose. But gradually, as more and more of the company starts to see the initiatives the company's doing, that's when it can spread to supply chain or to you know, the, uh, the CFO's office as they start to realize the value of this. And then I think the most important thing you can do is make the business case for purpose, right? Um, another great example we give is Adidas, who is one of our clients. Um, in 2017, they started making an ocean plastic shoe. This is a shoe made out of trash pulled from the ocean. Uh, at first, it was a consumer marketing kind of nice to nice product innovation. They sold 7,000 pairs. This year, they're going to sell 11 million pairs of shoes at $225. So that, if you do the math, is $2 billion of incremental revenue solving one of the biggest problems on the planet, which is ocean plastic trash. The minute the CFO of Adidas is seeing that, it goes from, oh, this is a nice to have thing to this is mission critical, this is business critical. So as fast as possible, build the business case for doing good inside the company. That's what will allow it to scale. Yeah, and think about that. I love that story. It's a great, great uh, anecdotal story that sort of ties everything we just said together. Think about all the incremental steps along the way that the employees that had to go from taking trash to creating sneakers, right? The, not just the techies, but everybody had to do. First of all, they're invested in the idea of it. This is a great thing. And the idea that they can sell millions of pairs of those of those sneakers going forward. But there's all of the tactical and things that have to be done along the way. And do you have buy-in? And are you are you using recognition and engagement tactics to make sure that people are truly invested in, in delivering that product in this case um, that fits the theme so well with the company? And again, engaged employees would be the, the way to get there uh, to make sure that everybody's aligned behind, again, purpose and engagement along the way. And I guess one last one, just in the minute we have left here, there's a question about budgeting. I look at this two different ways. You know, the I think Afdel is making the case here that you know, you spend money to get money. It's return on investment, but both in employee engagement programs and in these purpose-driven programs, the investment comes first, the return comes second, right? So you have to get that C-suite to understand that. And from a budgeting standpoint, very often it's half of 1% to 1% of employee pay. If you wanted to generate behavior change within your company and get greater levels of engagement, and you went out and said, we're going to give everybody a half a percent raise on Monday morning, Tuesday morning, nothing will have changed. They'll be thankful for the extra half a percent, but nothing's going to change. Again, assuming you're paying them what they're supposed to be making to begin with. You put a half of 1% of their of their overall payroll into a recognition reward program generate, generated to help build culture and support of corporate values, and you're going to see that needle move tremendously. And then I guess the on a budgeting standpoint, after all, I assume that you know speaking about larger projects like scooping up ocean trash and turning it to trash and turning it into sneakers is is really from a budgeting standpoint is is really C-suite conversation about where to put their resources. And, and I think if the flip side of that is uh, retention, right? So the cost of replacing an employee is what? 1.2 times their salary, right? So if you can build a model and say, look, this investment in, in incentives and purpose is helping people stay longer uh, and look at the, the upside of not having to go and spend all that money on recruitment and trying to get new people to come in and employee engagement and motivation. That's how you build a multi-dimensional business case for purpose, really. Perfect. Well, with that, we're out of time and I uh, appreciate everybody joining us here today. I'll turn it back over to Mike. Thank, Thank you, you Brian. Thank you, Brian and Aftel for sharing your knowledge and time with us. This webinar will be available for playback for up to 90 days. Simply log into world.work.org and access your profile. Uh, please allow 24 hours for that information to appear. A reminder that we are going to send out a short survey at the end of this event. We highly appreciate your feedback. And if you have not downloaded the presentation from the chat pod, I will post that link again momentarily. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording now and go ahead and share the HRCI and SHRM codes.